Welcome back to session six. In the first part of session six, we're going to talk about the Antonicene church. Early church hymnody is what we're going to talk about. So where we want to begin is with the music of the New Testament church itself. What do we know from the New Testament, from the pages of the New Testament themselves, about how the church sang and what they sang and what it, what it says about music? Well, there are several things. It's almost surprising how much is in there. In the first place, there are several what they call New Testament canticles. Most of them have to do with the, the time around the birth of Jesus. Uh, there's the Magnificat, which is Mary's song of praise. There's Zechariah's prophecy called the Benedictus. And there's Simeon's praise called the Nunc Dimittis. Lord, let now thy servant depart in peace. Then there's, of course, the Gloria, which is uh, Luke 2.14, the angel's song, where it says that they uh, praised God and said glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now what's interesting about all those canticles is that the Bible itself does not say that those words were sung, um, and yet the words are poetic. And uh, in the Greek mind and, and uh, much of that culture in those days, if you spoke in poetry, it was sung. It was uh, song. The, the line between spoken word and, and sung word was much less than it is today. If you think in terms of Gregorian chant or that sort of thing, then you realize they spoke, but they spoke on pitch. And so uh, most likely those really were songs, at least it was poetry, and the, the word for poetry and song were the same. Then we find in the New Testament not just these uh, so-called canticles, we also find several references to singing. So let's look at at least a few of those. James 5, 13 says, if any among you is sick, then call the elders and have them lay hands. Um, Right before that, he said, is any among you merry, let him sing psalms. So there you go. Uh, it'd be good to sing if you're merry. It's a command. It's an imperative. First Corinthians 14, Paul's talking about the assembly, and he says, when you come together, each one has a psalm. So everybody's come, ready to contribute. After the Last Supper, Jesus and the disciples sang a hymn before they went out to the Mount of Olives. And of course, Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 we've already dealt with, uh, that uh, Paul encourages the church to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Uh, Luke 15.25, this is one that uh, you might not have thought of. In the story of the prodigal son, remember this? Uh, he, he returns to the father's house and the father says, put a ring on his finger and a robe and kill the fatted calf, and they are celebrating together. While the older son is still a long distance away, he hears the sound of, it says, music and dancing. So it wasn't just music, it wasn't them singing, it was dancing. Somehow that music was I had instrumental music, they had drums, whatever. He could tell there was dancing going on, and it made him uh, envious and sad because uh, his father didn't have parties for him, didn't kill a fattened calf for him. You remember that part of the story? Well, just think about that. Now, who is the father in that story? Well, it's God. And who is the prodigal son? Most likely it's Gentiles. Who's the older son? It's Jews. What is the house? The house is the church. And when God um, kills the fatted calf, as it were, and invites the Gentiles, the ones who weren't even seeking after him, the ones who had gone astray, he invites them in. What kind of mood is there in the church? It's the mood of music and dancing. That is the mood that should permeate the church. In Matthew and in uh, Luke, uh, Jesus makes a brief reference with regard to John the Baptist about how the uh, Pharisees uh, treat him and John the Baptist like children who say, we sang a sad song for you and you, you didn't mourn and we sang a happy song for you and you didn't dance. and You guys just aren't going along with what we say. Revelation 18, a rather strange reference to Babylon and how she's fallen and how there will be no more music in her streets, no more instruments for Babylon. All of normal life would stop for Babylon. Hebrews 2.12, subtle little thing. In the midst of the congregation, I will hymn you, it says. In the midst of the congregation, and there in Hebrews 2, it clearly is talking about Jesus. They're quoting Psalm 22, 
and saying, this is about Jesus. This psalm is about Jesus. And Jesus sang in the midst of the congregation. That's a pretty cool thing. I wonder if Jesus was tone deaf. I, I wonder if he had a nice voice. I wonder if he trained his voice, if he took lessons. I wonder if he just naturally had perfect pitch. I don't know. But in any case, he sang. In the midst of the congregation, he hymned about God. And now we get not just references to singing, but perhaps quotes or partial quotes from some hymns uh, themselves. In Acts 4, 24, this is a little obscure, but it says that they raised their voices together in prayer. I wonder how they all prayed the same thing at once. Perhaps that could have been translated in unison. They, they lifted their voices in unison. Does that mean that they uh, memorized this prayer? Uh, it's pretty unlikely, but uh, on the other hand, these all were Jewish people, and they were used to having um, memorized prayers and saying those things in the synagogue. So, in Ephesians 5.14, there's a little reference to uh, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Is that a hymn? Perhaps a hymn fragment? Perhaps it was a popular chorus that they sang at uh, baptism times? In any case, it sounds kind of poetic. Uh, it's interesting they call it a hymn fragment instead of a chorus. We find Paul writing to Timothy and saying, this is a faithful saying, and then he has this poetic thing, lasts about three verses, and uh, I, I, again, it seems like a hymn. It's a faithful saying. Whenever Paul says this is a faithful saying, perhaps he's quoting some philosopher. If so, we don't know where the quote came from. Perhaps he's quoting the Old Testament, but this isn't from the Old Testament. Or perhaps he's quoting what Timothy would have known well, which is... Uh, you know, a hymn. Philippians 2 have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, and uh, it's very Christocentric. Uh, we're pretty sure that was a hymn. Colossians 1, likewise, uh, not even a hymn fragment, but uh, an entire hymn, or at least a, a stanza of a hymn. Um, it, he, he bursts forth in a couple of doxologies, one in the end of Romans chapter 11 and one in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. But very possibly, Paul often alluded to a hymn that people in the church that he was writing to knew. If so, it had been written by people within the church, most likely, and it was something that they sang on a regular basis. That's a beautiful thought, isn't it? Well, those are some New Testament references, both some, some hymns that have been quoted and some references to people singing or playing. Let's go beyond the pages of the New Testament now and see what, the, what happened in the early church. We'll go as early as we can and see what evidence there is of their singing in the early church.